Well, the first thing that we do when we reach out to the gods is learn the sacred language, which is a series of dots and dashes hidden within the runes known as Norse code. Something that comes up from time to time as a heathen is that latent Christianity will bar us from practicing elements of our faith that have similarities to Christianity. We overreact when leaving the faith and just go running in the opposite direction. Or we make grand statements about heathens do not pray kneeling before the gods or some other such claim that has no basis in history in order to create some kind of narrative differentiating ourselves away from Christians. Now, the first thing to examine here is that heathens and antiquity did indeed pray. It's not some foreign import into the faith or something like that. It's a continuation of tradition. In fact, we find examples of prayer across pre-Christian traditions. We find it in the Hellenic, the Roman, Kemetic traditions. And all of these are contemporaries to our ancient traditions. And we find no reason to say, like, ours is some kind of exception among these. So... Let's get back to kneeling for a second. Is it somehow correct to kneel or stand before the gods in prayer? There's no basis for the narrative that heathens would stand in prayer because we see ourselves as equal to the gods, right? The view that the gods are grand and beyond us rings true in the myths and sagas. So it's bad justification to say that we stand for that reason, you know. I do, however, personally, stand when praying most of the time. But that has far more to do with, like, my personal comfort. And, you know, I'll just, like, fidget or something like that when I'm kneeling for too long. And it's more to do with that than, like, some bizarre notion that I'm equal to ageless beings governing the various forces within our cosmos. But how did heathens pray? And how should we pray? There's very little in the sagas about prayer rituals or magical practices themselves, as they were preserved by Christians who had very little interest in preserving these elements of our tradition. But we do, however, have writings from Greek, Roman, and Kemetic tradition. And from there, we can rebuild something that we can use today. Now, across these traditions, there does seem to be a set of, com of commonalities, or parts of prayer, which I'll give an overview. But this is expanded upon in my friend uh, Mark's blog of Axe and Plow, which I'll link below. He tends to write heathen content on what you might call like, you know, a heathenry 401 level. <laughs> so if you want to give that a deep dive, he's great. First is the invocatio or invocation. This is the formal approaching of the deity through the use of their name or perhaps a kenning. For example, you may start with announcing your prayer to Scotty the goddess of winter in the hunt. Or you may refer to her by a kenning, such as the huntress or lady of the mountains or whatever kenning you might want to build out of her associations of, with uh, wolves, archery, winter, mountains. Um, but this introduces to whom the prayer is addressed. In polytheistic tradition, there is more than one deity. So this part is essentially like addressing your letter. You're pointing your prayer in a direction with your intention. The second part is the argument or pars epica. This is the part where someone lays out the why of the prayer, which you might describe an aspect of the deity whom you're appealing to. Uh, it's here that you would give the reason why you are approaching this deity or deities in particular. This is your moment where you would give your appeal to the gods to listen. A climber facing a challenging moment in his ascent may open his prayer to Skathi in hopes that the mountain might not bring him harm by noting in his argument that he has devoted his climbing as part of his relationship to her or a huntress may appeal to Scotty to bring her calm, as Scotty is the protector of hunters, and she does not want to bring suffering to the animals she hunts. The last part is the precis, which is the prayer itself. This part is more freeform and the goal of initiating the prayer. In here might be a token of friendship to a deity, in the case of a prayer of praise, or a request of some kind to a deity. This is also where one might make an offering as part of the prayer. To reference back to our examples, this is where a climber would make his request for a safe climb, or at least a safe place to rest and decide to where to go next. Or the huntress might let Scotty know that she is having difficulty remaining calm and ask for aid in that goal. As you can see, this is largely the who, what, why of your prayer. Uh, there are purposes to this structure. Prayer from the perspective of the heathen is not meant to be an aimless cry for help, but a directed and intentional statement 
toward a deity or deities in particular. And this is why the invocation portion is important, as is the precis, because after that direction is given, you then offer what you are giving direction to in the first place. The argument, however, can be, you know, kept or excused. Historically, we find that it's the portion of prayer that is often left out, but it's present enough in historical examples to have a name given to it. It's particularly left out in prayers of praise, as it doesn't seem that there's, you know, much reason to give an argument when offering simple praise or thanks. There are moments, however, when we might not have an argument, or it's the first time that we're reaching out to a deity. Typically, one would want to build reciprocity with deity before a request for prayer, but let's face it, that's not always how life works, uh, especially in our culture where many of us, you know, heathens are ex-Christians struggling to find our way around this faith. So sometimes during the argument, one might acknowledge that they hadn't seriously considered prayer before this moment. And I think sometimes the most compelling prayers are the one where that acknowledgement is present. For example, uh, an argument might simply be, Tyr, God of justice, I have never prayed or given offering to you before, but I've felt your pull and here I am. Now, I'll answer three common questions that I get on prayer kind of beyond this. So do you need to write it out first? Uh, this can be useful when you're starting out, but it doesn't need to be done, really. I generally don't write out my prayers, personally, but I do write out more involved rituals uh, for offering, especially ones that I do publicly. And it honestly depends on your approach. If you find that this helps you in preparation for prayer, then it's what you should do. If you find that you operate better in a free-form environment, then you should operate that way. Prayers do not need to be especially long or involved. Uh, a prayer requesting protection can be as long as two or three sentences. Um, just like one sentence for each part of the prayer works just fine. Or you can go the Christian Southern Baptist route and go on for two damn hours. There's no restriction either way. Just you know, make sure that no one's depending on you for time as you might screw up some people's schedules. I was raised Southern Baptist, I can say that. Um, <laughs> I've had that experience. Uh, but one thing that heathens don't really have is any sort of official book of prayer like Episcopalians do. The Troth has put out a, uh, a book of bloats, which is not really the same thing, but it is, however, a good place to start if you're interested in exploring what the heathen community has already built in this, you know, line of, of something. <laughs> All right, words are hard. Um, so bloats and prayers are not necessarily the same thing because bloats are typically like larger... Uh, group events that involve a sacrifice, whereas prayers, you know, might be a smaller solitary sort of thing and doesn't necessarily need a sacrifice. So, but, you know, you have, you can have like a group prayer, you can have a solitary bloat. It's, it doesn't, there's gradients between these labels really. Which leads us to the next question, which is, do you need to have an offering? Now, often offering a sacrifice is part of a prayer, but an offering is not required to have a prayer. Offerings are part of prayers and rituals associated with reciprocity, as the gifting cycle fosters our relationship with deity. But offerings might be absent from a prayer that is offered, say, in moment of desperation. Um, the mountain climber, for example, may still offer a prayer while he is clinging to the side of a rock, and he doesn't have like the time or facilities to set up an altar and make a formal offering. He would instead lean on the fostering of that relationship that he had done prior and the fact that he's currently in an act of devotion. Same with the hunter, who needs to be focused on the task at hand more than selecting a sacrifice for the moment, as she's requested a calm so that her aim might be steady. Now keep in mind, she might be aiming at the very moment that she prays. But in both of these cases, the climber might you know, give an offering after having finished his ascent or safely making a camp in thanks, and the hunter might give part of her trophy as an offering in thanks for a successful hunt. Um, and they would do this because they want to give thanks for gifts given from Scothi. And that thanks would be structured in the same way, addressing Scothi, making the argument as to why she is being thanked, and then giving the thanks itself. Now, the last question is, who is to be prayed to and when? Now, mainly this question is around which gods at which moment? And the answer to that is, it depends. Maybe there's a deity that you feel especially drawn toward, that you go to with many prayers. This is typical of Lokians, for example. But usually, you want to match the subject of your prayer with the deity. In the examples, I mentioned Skathi, because she is heavily associated with the challenges that the people in our examples were facing. But someone seeking justice, for example, may pray to Tyr. Someone seeking healing might pray to Er, or perhaps Thor. Someone seeking wisdom may pray to Odin, Freya, or Bragi. 
or, or even multiple deities. Remember, this is polytheism. <laughs> we don't need to restrict our prayers to a single deity. And the question also applies to whether or not it's just the gods who are to be prayed to, or if prayer is meant for the land whites or land spirits as well. Now, I find that there's a proclivity among heathens to see the gods as something to be prayed to and worshipped, and the land whites as something to just be respected. I don't find this to be accurate to the historical view of heathenry. We see in the sagas time and time again, moments where the land whites take part in the journeys of the heroes. It follows then that reciprocity with the land whites would be entirely justified. Much of heathenry is about establishing a gifting cycle with those around you, including the gods and spirits. So making a prayer and offering to them is entirely legitimate and even shows up in other cultures. So with the land whites, you might not know their names, but you can offer a prayer and a portion of your meal to the land whites around you as part of your practice. You know, I, for example, have a little space where I leave offerings out in the yard with a quick prayer. Now, as far as when, we find historical examples across cultures of prayers in relations to things that we might find like mundane or unimportant to bother a god with. So the conclusion there is that our image of what is unimportant to bother a god with is historically just off. We've been so attuned to the Christian concept of God being this omnipotent and perfect being that it burns in our heads this idea that we wouldn't matter to him. And even Christians would object to this, and so should the polytheist, as many gods that we worship are chiefly interested in the affairs of humans. So praying to them for safety while you're traveling, perfectly reasonable and legitimate. The thing we do find, however, with prayer is that we are to push the wheel ourselves after a prayer. If we pray for good crops and we don't plant the seeds, then the gods have no reason to give good harvest as there is nothing to harvest. So the prayer should be backed up by action and the gods may help us in our endeavor should they choose to do so. But with that... Hail to my patrons for making this content possible. It's good to have people at your back. This channel's been growing a ton lately, so I hugely appreciate everyone sharing my videos. Remember to hit the subscribe button and make an offering to the Tech Gremlins by clicking that bell and leaving a comment with your thoughts. And remember to find a way or make one.